Welcome to the Vibrant Living Network. Have you ever wondered what is possible beyond possible? What is the thing you've been wondering and inquiring about? Are you just feeling stuck and don't know why? Are you thinking or are you seeing? Seeing allows us to expand and have this other experience. We want to invite you for that wake-up call. We want to invite your spirit, your soul, so to be more alive, more connected. Glenn Brooks has been a life coach for over 33 years, author of Divorced to Patterns, Not Each Other, an explorer of what is possible. He has worked with people all around the world. Join us for a wake-up conversation, a dialogue with you. We will have some of the most interesting contributors. We will be talking to some of the most interesting people and have some of the most resourceful teachers, wisdom-filled people from around the world join us. Share your voice, ask the questions, become free of the known into a new world of possibility. We are going to talk about all the things you wonder about, how to live, how to heal, how to connect, how to love, how to be seen. Your life is precious. Enjoy it. Hello, and thank you for listening. Thank you for participating, questioning. How many people thank you for questioning today? How many people appreciate your question? Hi, I'm Glenn Brooks. You're listening to the Vibrant Living Network as we expand our network with programs. And this last week, I just had the honor of meeting so many I just meeting people that are continuing to growing young, becoming more aware. Like that, there was a book called Twice in a Lifetime. And the whole idea is this guy woke up 80, 80 years old and he said he, he breathed for the first time. I want to just check and see if the whole crew's here today. Lisa? Crew number one, yes, uh, number one crew. Oh my God, there you are. Totally by surprise. Yeah, I, Wonderful. No, I was listening uh, and uh, breathing. Breathing in and, ah. and grateful for the day. I want to thank you for producing a miracle, from what I understand. Ah. Uh, yeah, you produced a miracle. I guess you, you took what I gave you yesterday about the writer for the show, and apparently you made it into something. And I want to thank you for that because I Hi, I know that I was a little I was a little discongruent in, in how I left that. And so thank you for being the master chef on the write up. We have uh, Bona Lisa's not just a producer; she's co-host a dear family member and here she is contributing always as she always deeply does deeply appreciate you lisa Likewise, Glenn. hey why don't you do this do this live lisa introduce the show based on the write-up and i want to say we're doing the series with john adago and john, lisa tomorrow is going to give us the writer for today's show but the consistent thing about john and the shows we've been doing with john is you know john over the last 40 years john has spent time with people around the world studying their lives or, or getting together with them, who are the people have, that have doored to life to, to what we call awakening. You know, it's like they're waking up. I want to ask you guys, I want you guys to write in and tell us what it means to awaken. What does awakeness mean? So with that, I'm going to pass it to Lisa before we go to John here at our panel, our round table of, of awakening. And let's all begin again today. Let's begin from this moment. So Lisa, since I gave you, I gave you some stuff in a not a particularly congruent state, you made a gourmet meal out of it. What's today's writer for the show with John? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> rather. Than, and I don't know if, if yes. John received what I distilled from from Glenn's uh, <laughs> writings. Yeah. John, yeah. welcome. Did were you able to get a, a copy of of what I? I Thank put you. Together? No, I have not. I did not. Ah. So it's it's deep within the mysteries of of it, and of that you morning. may have sent it, but I didn't open it this morning. So <laughs> okay, no that that's that's like, that sounds like a, that sounds like a that sounds like a hallmark a hallmark greeting card response. I like that. Uh, you, you might have sent it, but I didn't open it. Just an idea, yeah. Lisa. Yeah. Please, but yeah. basically, in in distilling what Glenn uh, brought forth. His, you know, he he talked about the flow and how Gurdjieff wandered and lived his life within the flow. He sort of traveled throughout the world, met people who showed up, allowed what came forth and, you know, really lived fully in the moment. And that was 
what I ascertained from from all of the the wonderful words that you gave me was how <laughs> do we you. how do we come from a place where we allow what is meant to unfold to unfold and to truly be in in the flow and uh, John since you have had a great deal of you know of over uh, I believe forty years of of really delving deep within this journey of of uh, what is the flow and, and Gurdjieff's teachings? Um, you know, I'll I'll let you start off as to you know what it is that best describes that for you in in your life and in your journey. Yeah. So Gurdjieff used the term waking up, and that's tossed around a lot today. Um, and I think the meaning's been a bit diluted because first he described the ordinary condition that we walk around in. And I remember when I first encountered some of the writings of, of these teachers, I was vaguely dissatisfied. I was not happy with the state of my, of my life, of uh, the quality of my relationships, of the way I interacted with people in events. And I thought that perhaps there was something that I didn't know, that there was knowledge that might be available that, that I somehow had missed in my higher education, uh, which was a very traditional college education, graduate school, et cetera. But then I opened up these books, and what they said was, well, this condition that you walk around in, where you're in a conversation with someone, and they say something, and it triggers an association, and then you think about something and perhaps lapse a little bit into a daydream and you miss the next few sentences of what they said. And then you come back or you're attempting to, to the best of your attentions, act appropriately to the situation. But somehow something gets in the way. Somehow I'm, I'm just not quite connected because I'm thinking about something that I want in the moment or something that I don't have in the moment or something I may be a little intimidated by. And when I heard that description, I realized, well, my goodness, no wonder I'm not connecting with people in the way I would like to. We all seek a deeper relationship with the people we care about. We all seek more meaning in our lives a deeper sense of purpose in our occupations. And yet often, somehow it eludes us. And what Gurdjieff said is, well, it's because you walk around in this condition that he called a waking sleep. But then he did something else. He presented methods by which you could refine the quality of your attention, connect with the present moment, Connect with your own body, with your own sense of existence. Actually connect with the person or people in front of you who you're speaking to in a deeper, more meaningful way. And when I read this, I, first I thought the description was irrefutable. Clearly, I was not living in a state that was up to the full potential of what I believed a man could attain. But this would have been a pretty dismal picture, except that what these teachers said is there's a way up. There's a way out. You can become a man or a woman of substance that's more of use to himself and the people that he meets. The, um, the quote that I had, John, um, and it may not have been really attributed to Gurdjieff. It says, I serve as a channel for a flow of energy. I serve so that the energy can be transmuted to one form or other, other form of beings, to other places that lead to the unknown, lead the unknown to me. So that, you know, um, and, and I can see, like, for you, when you know, just even connecting with you this week, uh, John has been experiencing uh, a different state of being in, in, a, in a different state, literally. 
And um, so when when you're away from from home and you're meeting you as you had said you you're in this awakened state, how do you feel that you embody that? Like as you're you're traveling across the country and and interacting with strangers who are who may not have had experiences with this. Well. In a previous conversation with Glenn, he mentioned that often people complain that they may be meditating or spending some time studying or contemplating, but they don't find that this is necessarily carrying over into their other daily activities. And that should not be the case. Because these, quote, spiritual exercises of meditation, contemplation, prayer, study, what they do is they make available a finer energy. In the Christian tradition, they would call it grace. In the Vedanta tradition, they would call it sattva. They're talking about a building up of subtle energy. And if one engages in some spiritual practices, meeting with other people to discuss metaphysical ideas, studying useful literature, meditation, contemplation, then what one finds is that as he then engages people in his everyday activities, there are moments when he wakes up, when he simply comes out of this sort of cacophony of random thoughts and feelings that are running around and moving us here and there, and actually fully connects with the moment and the people around him. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, it's possible for there actually to be an event. And the event is, I connect with the people around me on a deeper, more profound level. Um, Ospensky had a term, he, he wrote a book titled In Search of the Miraculous. That wasn't actually his title. Um, it was a publisher's title. But what he meant by the miraculous was a penetration between the thin veneer on which we live, think, and associate during our normal day. He wanted to go deeper within himself. Not that it cut him off from his surroundings, but that it allowed him to relate to his surroundings from a deeper, more profound place within himself. And this is possible for a man or a woman. This is available to a man or woman with two big ifs. First, he has to come in contact with sacred knowledge or esoteric knowledge or the truth. Someone who has an understanding of of what it is to reach the full potential of a man or a woman. And second, he has to apply that knowledge in his life and work. So I can be taught an initiation. I can be given initiated into a practice of initi- of meditation. But then it's up to me to practice. What Gurji said is, I can't help you. I can only provide knowledge and propitious conditions through which you can help yourself. Then you have to be motivated to raise your level of being, to deepen your level of understanding, to develop the ability to put aside your own desires and fears and take care of the people and things around you that it is your duty to take care of. We're talking with Dago here and uh, Vibrant Living Network, Lisa LaRose, Glenn Brooks, exploring how we, we can become more awake and also to bring our awakeness into things that deeply challenge us, right? to bring, so it's not just avoiding the things that disturb us, but how do we bring that awareness? I just came, I was in, I was in traffic court this morning, and I realized the more I was awake to what was happening in the room, it kind of took me out of my own dreamland. I was really very awake in the room at a certain point. I noticed people's bodies. I noticed how before they said something where they held themselves, and it became, so right before it was my turn, I just had this notion when I when I interacted with the uh, the judge. I just said, I said, uh, "Good morning, your uh, Good morning, Your Honor," and bless you. 
And he, all he said to me was, what do you say? He, he said, you're dismissed. And that was our only exchange. Now, there was a brief moment where I was thinking I could ask for, I could ask something else, but I realized it was so simple. He just told me I was released. And I realized all the stories that I had about that situation were gone, gone as well. And made me realize how much the temptation is to go into these stories, to go to the movies about what's going to happen, what could happen. And, and also when we do that, it activates the other person's fear. Um, there's a legendary story, Lisa and John, when I, when I did get interested in the Course in Miracles, the first story that kind of got me really curious about the Course was this idea that we share this holy mind. We share this infinite self, and we're all connected. There's no separation. Of course, you come here, you're born, and you get an identity, and you're supposed to be special and compete better and outdo people, and, and then you're supposed to fall in love rather than awaken in love together. But the story was about this woman in, at Penn Station, and she's... Uh, She's being trailed by this guy. And uh, the, the person who wrote the story is Dr. Jerry Jampolsky, a psychiatrist who discovered peace of mind. So the story goes that she, he's trailing her, the guy in the, pen, the, uh, the, the station. And in the course, it teaches that we, we exist in two states. We kind of exist crying out for love and then extended love. And, and basically, the course also says, well, there's just love. And it's, it's such a different teaching that, that we live by and kind of don't breathe by. But she's, she, she's immediately drawn, her thoughts are fixated up that he's going to rape and kill her. And she gets him, she, she basically turns to him and said, hi, do you want to go get coffee with me? And he says, yes, I'd like to get coffee with you. This is like a holy moment, right? This is a moment beyond our, our mind. This is a moment of, she's asking him this from being awake to something that's different than her personal mind. And he's responding different than her, his personal mind. And at coffee, as she's talking to him, she says, down in the station, she goes, I had these thoughts. You were going to rape and kill me. And he says, I was going to rape and kill you, but something happened, and I felt a connection with you far beyond what I was expecting. Right. So that was the miracle moment. That was the holy moment. And I got very interested because of many different things that I read. I wanted to be able to live this and awake to it. We're going to continue with John and Dago so we could bring this in our lives, become more awake, and go beyond the conditioning and the, and the reinforcement that, just, that keeps us in fear in, in an emergency state. Stay, stay with us for more for, I used to be able to say this, stay with us for more of the Viber Living Network. Appreciate you guys. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. I want to wish you an awakened moment, an awakened afternoon. It's Glenn Brooks here at the Vibrant Living Radio Network. We're a speakers bureau. We're a format that explores what's possible beyond possible. 
Many if you woke up today and you said, what's possible beyond possible? Like how, how could it be different? Those are those beautiful moments in the day. Joining us, Nate Hughes, who's, um, so he, he helps people connect to the, the world of restoration, retreats, regeneration. I've been designing retreats, by the way, since I, probably my early 20s and, and started out in the Hamptons. John Adago, uh, he's written these amazing books on how to really begin to wake up. He's met some people around the planet that were considered to be awoke. And I, I always thought that was an interesting thing. Lisa, when I, when I heard about, I guess you could say my first book that transformed my life, I started shoplifting after reading this book, by the way, public uh, acknowledgement, because I started to realize, like, who's shoplifting? It seemed like fun at the time. But I read this book called Three Magic Words by U.S. Anderson. And when I finished reading that book, I just had a totally different perspective on things, perspective I never had before. And I started to see, like, oh, when I, when I take things, I'm taking it for myself. And I didn't have that notion. I guess you could say I got really drawn into something very different so when I went to school, I brought my own books to school, and I started reading from different books. So it's interesting how our past, like Lisa, you know, Nate, and John, they we each grow up in our personal history and our, our conditioning, the culture of that conditioning that affects our bodies, our local anthropology, kind of other people's beliefs. I'll give you an example. I thought of this the other day. I never knew what I never knew what prejudice was, and so I moved to New Jersey. And a lot of people might say this. I don't know, but I went to moved to New Jersey. I was collecting bottles at my friend. And his mother said, well, don't collect bottles. And we were like, why not? And she said, because black people might have drank from those bottles. I never heard this before. I never heard this before. And it was like, I thought to myself, how puzzling she would say that. So I think, I guess you could say that what began to happen was I, I, I heard things and I saw people do things and it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense why they would say things. It didn't make sense that... um and then I go to school, and school seems to never address these things. School seems to talk about a whole bunch of outside irrelevant things. It was kind of like, what was relevant about, about this? It seemed to be relevant that as you're moving, you got an awareness you're moving. It seemed to be relevant. You could be connected to your creative craft, right? This seemed, these things seem more relevant. So I guess you could say as, as, as the moments went on, I got more and more curious, and I would, I would start to read. And then I start to meet people. I met a, I met a fashion model early on. And she told me that the, the cosmetic she was using was poisoning her. She wrote a book called The California Way to Natural Beauty. She invited me to her apartment in New York City to have a meeting. I designed my first seminar with her. And no one ever told me about this world. It's like a hidden world around us right now. Nate, since you're here and on the spot, I want to welcome you. Thank you. How did, so how did it happen for you? What was your, you know, because you, you know, obviously you're in the world of people like John that are kind of, Engaging people in a different way for days. It's kind of an interesting thing if you think about what a retreat is. It's kind of engaging people in a whole different way of seeing and bringing that back into life. And sometimes it's successful. How, what, what was your journey? What happened to you that kind of pulled you a, a little back from the condition and everything around you? Like, what, what was your first noticing? You know, I was very young when I started to realize that there was something missing from my life and there was something missing from those all around me. And, I questioned along with my cousins who were close with me, like what all these people were doing in life and why they were so serious and committed. And I started to write it off as I got a little older, but I was onto something and that pushed me through, you know, a lot of questioning, but I also wrote it off because that's what everyone around me told me to do, but it was still there buried. And I went through, you know, graduate school just kept trying to get somewhere and those questions never really settled themselves. And once I had finished graduate school, I kind of went through a really low point in my life. Um, one of those dark nights of the soul, as you would say. And, um, mm -hmm. I really, really questioned everything. Cause again, I had a really great achievement. You know, I got an MBA in international business with a focus on nonprofit management and mm -hmm. had worked with some really great people, but I still was, even more unhappy than I was before I started it. And this achievement was supposed to make me happy. <laughs> and oh, nice. I, I'm searching for jobs and careers. And I picked up a book. This is a lot of people have picked up a book. And I think this is a great, this is a great paradigm shift for a lot of people where they pick up a book and they read a passage and all of a sudden 
it answers this question that's been lingering there for quite some time. And believe it or not, I, I'm going to say the same thing you said, disclaimer, that I kind of laugh when this was the book because I'd read it now and kind of say it. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 Eckhart Tolle is the power of now. <laughs> and um, mm-hmm. and that kind of opened everything up to me to just throw away these thoughts that I had and just start living a more deliberate and simplified life that aligned with what flowed naturally and then not go through the whole story. That's eventually what led me to come work at a retreat center, which was called Menla and then led me into understanding the retreat world and to tie it into what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's like these retreat centers are becoming a deeper version of the books that you and I have read that are mm-hmm. all encompassing and they're allowing people to take more of this quality of how to truly be yourself. I think it's John O'Donohue, the Celtic mystic researcher and poet who talks about how when we're indifferent, we give all of our power away. And so it's like Mm -hmm. when this light is shed and we become perceptive, we see things through a different lens. And that's what John today has been talking about to some degree. It's this manner of awareness that comes to us. And retreats can give us these moments of insight and I've seen so many around me go through it and that's really what's inspired me to help people continue to be able to facilitate these type of things and lead these kind of lives that are not only, you know, followed through some core values, but they're deliberate in the sense of like, you really do question every step you take and not in the conceptual way, but you really feel it intuitively to make sure that it aligns with what you really are supposed to be doing. You know, I, I thought about this idea of retreats. So I started designing retreats um, in the Hamptons, a place called Fish Cove. And they were open weekends for people to come. Because I would meet people. I was a connector. And people would come out and meet there. And um, I realized it was so different. To ret- you know, back then when I thought about retreats, so when I think about ret- vibrant retreats and forwards, I think to myself, well, how can I bring people together to have an experience that's very different than our common use of language? So, I, I was, so what I was going to do is ask, you know, you, Nate, and Lisa and myself, I'm asking out, out loud here, if we were going to go sp- spend three days with John Adago, Mr. Adago, he's right here, who's really been, you could say, in some ways, dropping out of time, becoming more aware of the moment as a practice. It's very different than we're going to get something from, I don't know, uh, you know, a movie. or It seems like this is a different inquiry. This is a different thing that we're you know, like for instance, I, I realize around John, I'm really, I'm always curious as an example with people who lead, who lead things, how they deal with this spilled, you know, coffee, or how do they deal deals with things that disrupt them? Because it seems like the main thing here is like, how does awareness actually help us in the nook and crannies? So I guess I'm going to stay. What I we're spending the next this week with John, and John's doing a uh, a weekend on practical awareness for a brighter life. I just made that. I love John. It's worth a hundred thousand dollars. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I was thinking, yeah, I want, I want to play more in the nooks and crannies. I want to become more aware of how these daydreams kind of capture me. How to, and, and particularly with the, the people that are diff- the people that I experienced a really challenge. Like I really like to play with this in really tight places. So I want to go to kind of explore with John in his life over the last 40 years, how he's taken situations that have just been so challenging and I want to I want to catch it not just in in his words and thoughts, but really in between his words. How he moves, how he interacts with people. So that's what I'm going for. And we're going to do this at a beautiful retreat in the Catskills, and it will be with you. What do you What would you want to spend? Uh, me and you and Lisa are going in the audience. What would you like to receive from this retreat with John? And I want you guys in the audience to tune into this too. And we're, we're going to dive into it. What would be your What would be your your aim? I I always love to feel those moments of timelessness in a retreat where the retreat leader can say something so profound and ask the audience to pause and take that in. And those are the moments that always, you know, stick with me where everyone in the room is awakened by that statement and that moment that everyone holds the space for everyone else in the room. And it's those moments of profound energetic insight that bring us present those those are the things that I look for and would look for in a retreat like this. And a retreat lasts a whole weekend, but there's there's flashpoints of that retreat that 
will always be with you when you leave. And those are the moments that I always hope that retreat leaders can bring. And it, and with a lot of the insights that John has shared here today on the show, we could only go deeper into those and explore those more profoundly. Yeah, All right, I'd like Lisa. To ask, I'd like to ask John, actually, because I know you have you've brought this work forth and, you know, you, you've spoken to a lot of different people. So, you know, I when you bring your teachings and your book forth on ancient wisdom how do you how do you bring that alive for people in a seminar experience or what do you envision for a retreat experience and and what uh where the focus would would lie uh primarily well glenn described being in court a little while ago and being aware of the people around him breaking a commercial? No, I, I, no I, I don't think we are. I think this either is Chris's favorite country song. Chris, you're, you're getting a leakage of music here. <laughs> Chris, you, I know he's dealing with it. It's oh, not, okay. It's really? Not, oh, my God. It, it's like a whodunit. It's like a whodunit, Chris. Who, <laughs> okay. It's hilarious is what it is. John will help us re re recover our awareness from this in a moment. When, he, when you can speak, John, you'll help us with this. This is All the right. funniest uh, thing. I know it's not on my, my end, I don't think. Oh, it, it left. No, either. it didn't leave. All right, Lisa, you're no, getting an award of innocence. So, Chris, is we, are we able to speak above it? I mean, can the yeah, audience hear this? Or, or the... Yeah. Okay. Is that a favorite song from your? Is that a favorite song from your childhood? Okay. Okay, oh, never heard it before. That, that. Okay, go ahead, John. If you can maintain your focus, yes. your open focus. Go ahead. Sure. What, what you described when you were aware of the people around you, but really, what was unique was you were in the picture. You weren't just aware of the people around you, but you had a sense of your own presence. Yes. And so you spoke quite effectively. And that brought the judge to an awareness of himself. And it was, what happened was interesting because he simply resolved and dismissed the case. Yes. Now, these are moments that happen to us, but the object of the work is that these become moments that we make happen. That in any given moment, I can be aware of myself. My thoughts, my feelings, my actions, the tone of my voice, my gestures. And then deepen that awareness to another level. In that I become aware of what I essentially am. Right? Because I'm not my thoughts and my feelings. I'm not my body. All these things are constantly changing. And if we take it all away, what's left? Well, what's left is the consciousness, the awareness that that's observing all of this. And so there's this witness consciousness, this awareness that's aware of the action I'm taking in response to the impulses that are coming in. And then the next step is to realize that I'm not what I observe. What I am, in fact, is the observer, the consciousness. And this observation is unique because it's an impartial awareness. There's no judgment. There's no criticism. What happens in these moments, if we have a glimpse of what is, just a simple glimpse of truth, of reality, unfettered by my desires, by my fears, by my thoughts, my associations, just a moment of heightened awareness. These moments, these conscious moments, are the pulses of the life. This is what builds up within a man of substance or a woman of substance. This is what we sense when we meet someone that we says, oh, this is a profound man, or this is a man of substance. This is a man who I immediately sense a goodness and something in there that I respect. What's so useful about these retreats, I mean, some people call them intensives. And they are intense in the sense that I'm surrounded by people who, are, who are, have a similar pursuit. 
we're involved in activities, discussions, reading of books, whatever the activities are, they're quite one-pointed. They're to heighten the awareness of myself, to deepen the sense of my own presence, and then begin to actually act and speak and move from that center point. Yeah, and that's power. I want to. Everyone can come together like that, no doubt. And again, I, I've been, I've been reading lately a lot of the works of John O'Donohue, which, again, a very poetic man, but also very in touch spiritually from a lot of different spiritual backgrounds. And that strikes me as something like he said. And you talk about bringing someone into the present and with those heightened awarenesses. And he says, you know, eternal time is unbroken presence, right? So we, mm. we come in touch with the timeless. And again, that leads back to what I was saying again, and what John is alluding to here is just very powerful experiences that are created. You know, I love what you said last week when John, when John was, we were talking about the Gurdjieff that Lisa brought up about, uh, what is now? You know, it's so funny, Lisa. The word that we use, because he's because for saying ordinary engagement. He doesn't use the word engagement. What word does he use? He, he uses excitement. Super efforts. No, super efforts. Super efforts. Thank you. So he's saying ordinary effort isn't enough. Ordinary effort is enough. He said only super effort. And then you brought up, which I love, Nate. You brought up the idea that a lot of us were raised in the culture that you had to be an A or an A plus. I met this actually, this genius orthopedic surgeon in New York City. I've never, never met anybody like this. His name is John Sorno. And his whole book, his work was on disappearing back pain. But the whole thing, the whole work was about that the type Bs, these are people that aren't type As, they store pain in their back in different parts of their body. And literally, people would go to his lecture in New York City and people's back pain would, would leave. But it was about that conditioning of, you know, that we have to be so much more, in our conditioning, we have to be so much better than normal and, and great. And we're going to continue with Vibrant Living. John Adago, we're talking about awareness retreats. This specific one with John Adago and you, with Lisa LaRose, Nate Hughes, and myself. Your life is precious. Enjoy. Stay with us. Feed your soul with waves of consciousness on Ohm Times Radio. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. I don't even know anything about it other than it's not, good. It's not a good time glad, to do anything apparently. Glad, glad three weeks or 22 days. 22 days, virtually retrograde. You know, I was just, I was just off the off air discussion is where was that music coming from? That was, we were, the, we were mystical detectives. Where was the music coming that was leaking what? in? You listening to the Vibrant Living Network. <laughs> we're talking with John Adago. We're talking about this idea of retreats. I like to call retreats Lisa LaRose, Nate Hughes, Vibrant Living team members here Thursday afternoon. I have, did have a I do I was thinking you know how things occur in your life you hear a piece of music you 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 know because this is really about I call it retreats and forwards because sometimes people go to retreats and they just kind of 
they get into this one mode and they get they get to the sidewalk and they get shocked. So I always thought you want to blend a retreat with a forward. So when I teach retreats, I'm always into the idea that people they're retreating, but then you also want to prepare them to become forward, to become alive again. So so that we could take this this vital awareness and bring it in our lives. And of course, John, I gotta admit, when I heard that music, I know this is gonna this is gonna surprise you, I'm pretty sure. Because I was thinking to myself, John went to the keys after four decades of studying his profound awareness work and being with all these teachers. John's going to go really modern and write a rap song. And he was, you're probably <laughs> thinking about the music. And all of a sudden it appears on the airwaves. Am I right or am I wrong? John? You're wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. Okay. I'm not going to write a rap I'm song. I'm humble with Absol- that. Absolutely. Okay, that's you're not, not going to write happen. a rap song. <laughs> okay, that's not going to happen. Okay. No matter, even though Nate recommends you writing a rap song, it's not going to happen. Well, maybe it'll okay. be a spiritual right. Nate, flow. Nate, sorry about that. <laughs> it'll be a spiritual flow. There's your flow. And, and what should so, happen on a retreat is yes. that a person touches a deeper place within himself. And, and, and that, that inner self, that inner essence, that's the place from which your creativity arises. Your inspiration, things that you write, your inspiration is the things you do. If, if, when something happens of substance in your day, it's because it arose from something deeper within yourself. We all have this experience like in the morning sometimes, we wake up and we suddenly have a solution to a problem that we went to sleep with the night before without the solution. All we had was the problem. Yeah. Then in the morning we wake up and we go, oh, now where did that inspiration come from? Where did that answer or truth come from? It came from deep within ourselves. And what retreats can do is create conditions that allow you to touch this reservoir of creative energy within yourself. And then when you leave the retreat, well, people complain because now certain conditions are not so propitious. You're out there in the world. You've got conflict. You've got Man. frustration. You have all the things that go on. But you're still there. And to some extent, you'll be able to bring that peace and that stillness from the weekend into a few moments of your day, and that can be transformative. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, in the modern world, in this world, relationships has, the relationship to time has shifted so much. So the most recent big article that just came out was actually on burnout and millennials. And millennials had such a big response. It was in BuzzFeed, the article. But it was just talking how millennials, for the most part, never had this experience of, um, like, they were talking about play, unscheduled play. And, uh, you know, it's funny, my daughter just shot, she's shooting a TV series on, uh, which she, well, the name of the series is called I Love Leisha, that's my daughter's name. And it's sort of like, it's, it's almost identical to I Love Lucy, which she, although she brings some beautiful nuances. But the 50s were a time, as an example. That, you know, I guess it had its own conditioning, its own asleepness. But then again, people had this other space. You know, Joel Goldsmith wrote his book. It was called um, The Thunder of Silence. And I got so inspired by that book when it, during a, a, a cycle of awakening. I, I, wrote, I rewrote it to call The Thunder of Silence for Couples, which is on relational meditation. But the thing he says, interesting, John, I want to get your comment. He says, even now, and let's say it was 1957. He says, even now, I, get, I sense the stillness is, is harder to access. What's your sense in modern times uh, of time and space, is this relationship to the space of silence in these times? Because clearly this, this article on BuzzFeed was just talking about how millennials don't feel any satisfaction unless they're doing, 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 right? It's a big thing about constantly doing it where there's no unstructured time. It's kind of like this. What's your sense being, being a practitioner and being this, you know, commitment and living your life from awareness. What have you noticed in relation to time and what would, what's your observation about the relation to time and entering silence and, and being in the, being in the world, kind of like some of those nuances that you very different going back 40 years. Well, conditions have changed. Men and women have not, uh, certainly were assaulted with impressions at a, at a much higher rate now than we were in the 50s. It's coming in from all kinds of directions. Um, and certainly 
the involvement with media is is it's almost all encompassing. But for us, the aim has to be to take some moments between the arising of desires. We have a constant flow of desires arising and us pursuing them throughout the entire day. But there are moments where one desire subsides and another one hasn't arisen yet. Now, usually we fill that with a plan or a worry or a concern. (laughs) But we can make another choice. That's a moment we're actually free to be silent, to come to ourselves. To perhaps remember, well, what is it that is important to me now, today, or at this time of my life? What is it right now that I think will deepen the experience of my life, give it more meaning? This can only be, it only has to be a reflection from a few seconds or 20 seconds, but it's a pause. It's turning the switch off. And it's a moment in which we exhale, we look up, we see the sky, we connect with the breeze and the trees around us. We feel the wind on our face, we feel our clothes, we feel our body. If we're walking along, we actually feel the feet touch the ground. I'm present, I'm aware. And in that moment, I'm free of desire. This is a big thing to be free of desire. Uh, People, People have the wrong idea about this. They think they get a desire arises. All right, I want a cup of coffee. So here's this desire. So I go and I get the cup of coffee and I feel kind of pulled to get the cup of coffee. And then I drink the cup of coffee and I go, ah, the cup of coffee made me happy. But actually, that's not what happened. What happened was when you had the cup of coffee, for the next few minutes, you were free of the desire. It was this freedom from desire that's this well-being or contentment or peace. And a part of this work is extending those moments when I'm just connected and contented with what I am and what is right now. So, John, there was this book, a fairly recent book written called Hair Mind, uh, Turtle Mind. Brilliant, incredibly brilliant book. His new book is actually called Click, Click Mind. He's talking about 80% of the new Nobel uh, Prize winners attributed intuition to their discoveries. And one of his big things now is he's talking about how the computer, the Internet, has really made people speed up. And in his first book, he talks about slow thinking, turtle mind. It changes your life. So it's part of what you're saying. And when we, so obviously what's happening is we're, we're transforming our brain. We're changing our brain because we slow our thinking down. The brain changes. And this is something as an example. They didn't really study four years ago. Um, and I think more and more people are making this connection now between awareness and consciousness and shifting the brain. And part of why they go to retreat is that they have a sense that, oh, my God, I've had these habits for 30, 40 years. And now, uh, Jeffrey Schwartz over at UCLA was showing that you could actually change the OCD brain. Did a study on it. Psychiatrist over at UCLA. What's something that moves you particularly about these times in teaching these awareness retreats to people now? Let's say in this time, particularly, distinct from any other time, what, what about now inspires you to teach, with, with, to work with people, and be in a room in a way that people could take this and make this a way, make this a way, of, a way of being in their life now? I think many people come in hungry. Um, They're dissatisfied. They want something and they're willing to work for it. Now, work in physics is defined as force against resistance. And the force has to be my will, my desire to change, my desire for my life to refine. The resistance are my habits. And I've had them all my life. And the way one becomes liberated from these habits, it doesn't happen instantly. 
It's a question of putting them under the light of observation. It's like turning on a light on a fungus. You turn on the light and the fungus begins to shrivel up and go away. And it's our attention, our consciousness that simply observes how I manifest, how I behave, how I relate, what I am. Do you feel like... One moment, John. Go ahead, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, would you give out your website so people can touch into your your books and and, uh, keep an eye out for your retreats? Sure. The two books are um, East Meets West, and the second book is Ancient Wisdom Can Can Enrich Your Life Today. Ancient Wisdom Can Enrich Your Life Today. And and my website is um, thejourneyback.net, thejourneyback.net. And there's contact information there, and they can lead you into places where you can purchase the books, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So you have been on vacation, which is a lot for some people, almost like a, a retreat. You know, you've been I, – I, when as you were talking about the your feet touching in, and I, I was picturing you out on the boat, out on the water. And uh, so when you're in a space like that, uh, away from you know your daily routine, what what comes to mind to you? Are you are you just in the the flow of the experience, um, allowing what is coming in, or are there things that you, uh, you a direction that you consciously take your thoughts um, in in experiencing something that's not in your day to day routine. Well, of course, it's a break from your everyday schedule, so there's freedom. And the phone's not ringing. I'm not particularly attending to emails, which is why I didn't get your bulletin, because <laughs> I, okay. I didn't bother to open my email, because <laughs> I'm on vacation. I think, I'm, <laughs> I'm, Give John I'm, credit. The, the object is for there to be a space. I mean, people go away on vacation, and they fill up the space. <laughs> The object is not to fill up the space. The object is to allow yourself to be open. Um, And it happens that I'm in the Keys, which is very pleasant. And so everything that's coming in is a beautiful impression. But what those impressions do is provide an energy that deepens the sense of myself. So there are, are deeper and longer moments of just being aware without pursuing a particular desire. Now, when I say prolong, they may only be a few seconds or a few moments. Uh, one teacher that I had, his name was Mr. Willem Nyland, and he wrote a little essay called Firefly. And it was, it was a beautiful analogy of this thing that lights up, which he compared to a faculty in our own mind. And it lights up for a few seconds or perhaps part of a minute or perhaps a minute or two and it illuminates myself and the area around me. And then it blinks out because that's the nature of the life we're leading. Other things come in, demands on our time, demands on our attention, things that we, quote, have to do. And he posed an interesting question in this analogy. He said, well, well, does the firefly light himself up or is just something that happens to him? Well, of course, in this work, what we're trying to do is I cannot resolve in the morning to say, I'm going to get up this morning and I'm going to wake up and I'm going to stay in that state until I go to bed tonight. (laughs) It just doesn't happen. That's not the human condition. But I can get up in the morning and spend take a few minutes for myself and read something inspirational, spend a few minutes perhaps contemplating or meditating. And then when I walk into the activities of my life, there's a little more sense of my presence. And if the activities are measured, and by that I mean we we don't work too many hours, we don't eat too much, we don't drink too much, pretty much everything, I wouldn't say everything, but pretty much almost everything is okay if it's done in the proper measure. Take nothing to excess. And if we begin to learn to live this way, 
then this subtle energy, this grace, this sattva built up within us. And we relate to the day and our events from a higher level of being. Now, it's not a dramatically higher. It's a spiral. You don't go from the valley to the tip of the mountain. It's a spiral. It's a lifetime's walk in a spiraling motion that takes you higher and deeper within yourself. That's beautiful. I, I, I and, really appreciate that analogy. Go ahead, John. I apologize. And, and, I, and I just I just realized that, you know, I've been almost eight days now, you know, on, on quote, on in a very beautiful place that allow, has allowed me a, a, a lot of time without any demands, without any external demands. And it puts you in a more, more profound and happier John, place. John, John, yes. this has been a great, you know, this is, is well, I just want to say, unfortunately, Chris scheduled another show after this. Could you believe it? I'm not sure why he did that, but our program, this program, this moment, it's going to transition. I just want to say thank you. I, I really enjoyed our exploration today. East meets West. John Adago, stay with us next week as we explore a different dimension of how to wake. Thanks to Nate, Nate Hughes, a vibrant living team member, awakened human being of the cat skills. Thank you, everybody. Your life precious. Enjoy. Thank and of you, course, Nate, Glenn, my Lisa. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. Love, Home Times Radio. <laughs>